Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm really excited to be moderating this event today and to be hosting this uh, with Jewish Studies at Hunter College, as well as the Roosevelt House. So thank you to the Roosevelt House for co-hosting this. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Leah Garrett. I'm the professor and director of the Center for Jewish Studies at Hunter College. And of all the events we've done this year, and there's been quite a few, I think this is probably one of the most important ones that we are holding. Um, so I'm going to talk just for a minute or two about what this event is about and why we're holding it. And then I'm going to introduce our very esteemed group of speakers. Then each of the speakers will speak for about five to 10 minutes. And then I will throw questions at the group um, based on what, what we're discussing. And then finally, at about quarter to two, depending on um, the level of questioning we have, we will take questions from the audience. So as we have our discussion and you have questions, please type them into the Q&A function as well. So the reason that we're holding this event is that the educational laws in New York require a substantially equivalent education to public schools for all of the private and independent schools. While this is the law, there are not mechanisms in many of the yeshivas to enforce this. So many of the yeshivas, in fact, most of the yeshivas aren't offering any type of full secular education on par with the public schools, including math, science, and literature. And in particular, this hits very hard uh, male, male students um, as well. As the director of Jewish studies, I feel that it's crucially important that we talk about this issue because we want our children to be fully educated like their peers. So the reason we're having the discussion today is that the New York State Education Department has introduced new regulations and have invited the public to comment on them until May 31st, so just a couple of weeks. And in short, these new regulations include the following, that the law which exists that requires all schools to teach basic subjects like English, math, science, and social studies, and that these regulations reiterate this law um, but this is this these new regulations will be up to the schools on how to in fact um, put them into place as as happens in the public schools different public schools do it differently but what will, will be new is that the schools will have to demonstrate their substantial equivalency to public school education through a variety of pathways so it's basically um, regulating the fact that yeshivas need to offer secular educations to their students. The new laws also will outline uh, the obligations of the local school, school authorities to regulate this so that there's oversight as well. Many ultra-Orthodox leaders are mobilizing to oppose these regulations, asking that their yeshivas continue to have full autonomy, and they're doing letter writing and uh, sort of um, uh, fighting back against this through the public domain. So we're holding this event and asking the audience think about these new regulations. We're also going to put on our chat function, uh, the web link where you can comment on the regulations and make your voices heard if you think it's important that Jewish kids and yeshivas uh, are getting a full secular education as well as a religious one so that they learn math and English and science and so on and so forth. So this is a very critical time when people can do something if it's of interest to them. And in order to submit a public comment um, on the, these regulations, um, as I said, we are providing the web link. So that's why this is so important. This is, this is a, of essential basic import to our uh, Jewish uh, young men and women in New York City. So let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have uh, Honorary Ruth Messenger, who was the president of the American Jewish World Service from 1998 to 2016, and is currently the organization's inaugural global ambassador. In this role, she is continuing her crucial work of engaging rabbis and interfaith leaders to speak out on behalf of oppressed and persecuted communities worldwide. And I'm going to ask our speakers if they can join by video now, please. Um, her presidency as AJWS followed a 20 year career in public service in New York City as a city council member and Manhattan borough president. We also have uh, Naftali Moster, um, 
who is the founder and executive director of Young Advocates for Fair Education, YAFED, which is the main organization mobilizing to put some regulations in place for students to have a secular uh, training as well as a religious one. Uh, he holds an MA from Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College and is the recipient of a Wexner Field Fellowship, which provides opportunities for professional growth to promising Jewish professionals. He's also a member of the ROI community, a professional development network for Jewish leaders. Our third speaker is Dr. Basil Smeichel, Jr., a distinguished lecturer and director of the Public Policy Program at the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College. He was appointed by former Governor David Patterson to serve as the executive director of the New York State Democratic Party during the 2016 presidential cycle, where he was the second highest rank, ranking Democrat in the state. He holds a PhD in politics and education and an MPA from Columbia University and received a Bachelor of Science from Cornell University. So we are so lucky and excited to have this incredible group here today. It's wonderful we can bring us all together to talk about this very important topic where we can actually have an impact. Um, I, we're going to go around now. Um, all of our speakers will speak for five to 10 minutes from their dif different and distinct standpoints. And then I will ask questions of the group, as I said, until about quarter two, when we're going to take questions from the audience. So today we're going to start, start with the founder of um, Yafed, which is the main organization mobilizing against this, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Naftali Moster. Um, and he's going to talk to us about any more details about the regulations and all the work his group is doing. And in particular, he's going to shed a light on his own personal background and why this is so important to him. And he'll speak for five to 10 minutes. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Garrett. And it's, uh, it's a real honor to be here. So um, yeah, I, my name is Naftali Moster. I grew up in the Hasidic community of Borough Park, which is a uh, Hasidic section of Brooklyn. I am the middle child of 17 kids, um, and I attended Hasidic yeshivas my entire life. Um, and then as I was a young adult at the age of 20, I had a, a strong desire to pursue a degree in psychology um, or to become a psychologist. I had very little knowledge of what that means. There weren't a lot of psychologists in my community. There was one that I knew of that actually lived in Israel and everyone talked about him being a psycholog, as you say it in Yiddish and in Hebrew, and, um, but I knew nothing of what it entails. So I walked into a local um, college geared to Orthodox Jews, perhaps not so much for Hasidic Jews, and um, I basically proclaimed I wanna become a psychologist, and it became very clear that I have no basic understanding of what it means, I have no basic ba educational background to pursue it, um, they asked me if I had a high school diploma. Of course, I didn't know what that meant um, because, and of course I didn't have one because I actually didn't have a high school education. Um, they tried to get me into the school through a different program where you, you take an entrance exam and then you pursue courses that are sort of like, they serve both as your high school diploma and towards your college degree. But that entrance exam consists of writing a, a simple essay in English and doing a, a basic math exam or quiz practically. And I couldn't do either. I had never heard the word essay before, let alone written one. So on the spot, the school, it's a small school, they really wanted my tuition. So they sort of taught me on the spot how to write an essay. And I ended up writing these two big blocks of text contradicting each other in the same, in the same um, essay, if you will, and so forth. And, and, and they got me in, I took a lot of remedial English courses and very early level um, math. Um, and it was a tremendous struggle. But for a long time, I didn't even know that my education growing up wasn't up to par or wasn't complying with the law. And it took me several years of struggling through college. And at that point I transferred to Kingsborough and, and then to the College of Staten Island. Um, and, and I finally thought to myself, I should look into what does the law expect of non-public schools, because for the first time I realized that I have a lifelong handicap as a result of my early education or lack thereof. And I thought, hey, this seems like educational abuse or neglect. And I thought I was the first one to coin the term. 
And, and then I did some research and, and a, a, a reporter helped me out a little bit. And I discovered that New York state law requires every non-public schools, including religious schools, to provide an education that is, quote, at least substantially equivalent to public schools. And I came across this webpage on the state education department's website that clearly articulated what that means to be substantially equivalent. They have to teach English, math, science, social studies, music, art, physical education, health education. And I look at the list and I'm thinking back to my years. So let me go back a little bit. In elementary and middle school, going to a Hasidic boys school, um, we had Judaic studies from 9 a.m. to uh, 3.30 p.m. Judaic studies taught in Yiddish based on exclusively uh, religious texts. And then at that point at 3.30 p.m. is when it flipped over. Sort of like an after school program, we had a little bit of what we called English. They attempted to teach us a little bit of English and arithmetic during that time. Um, I say attempted because it wasn't taken seriously. It wasn't like the first part of the day, the Judaic studies that we actually took seriously. So, um, and it was considered like a joke. You know, many kids basically would say it was like another 90 minutes of recess before we, you know, pack, you know packed out and, and left uh, to go home. This was an elementary and middle school. So 90 minutes at the end of the day, basic English and arithmetic, only four days a week because Friday we finished early because of Shabbos, the, the Sabbath. Once we entered high school, our school days got longer. We attended yeshiva from as early as 6.30 or 7 a.m. And we went till 8.30 or 9 p.m. So we're talking about a good 14 hours a day in yeshiva, but we studied exclusively Judaic studies. No English, no math, no science, no social studies. What I'm describing here is currently, as we speak, happening in dozens of yeshivas or hundreds of yeshivas across New York State. I do want to correct you, um, Dr. Garrett. It's not just, not all yeshivas, it's, or the majority. It's specifically in the ultra-Orthodox. And, and within that, it's most common within the Hasidic boys school. Irony, of course, for a lot of people, they assume the girls get the shorter end of the stick. And to some degree, you might say they do. The reason the boys don't get as good an education, the girls get about half the day secular education, is because boys are all groomed and expected to become rabbis as they grow up. Their counterparts, the girls, and the same Hasidic sects and the same you know, family even, they'll get a much better education because they're expected to grow up to be the breadwinner as their spouses, the, the men, are expected to grow up to be rabbis. So this is what the situation looks like. It looks like for me, and it continues to look like for tens of thousands of children as we speak. So I began looking into it. I began approaching state officials back in 2011, and they sent me back to the city, and then the city sent me back to the state. It was a back and forth. Finally, I formed an organization in 2012. Then fast forward in 2015, we filed a complaint with the New York City Department of Education. Um, we had 52 yeshiva graduates and parents sign the letter alleging that their schools, and we had a total of 39 listed, did not meet that minimum threshold of substantial equivalency. New York City announced an investigation, and then it became clear that they're dragging their feet for political reasons. At some point, New York State Education Department, the state, um, uh, decided to revise the guidelines that apply to these non-public schools to make it clearer what is expected of the school, what is expected of the a local school authority like New York City or other school districts on how to enforce it. They released guidelines in 2018 and those were struck down in court on a procedural ground. So the state re-released them in 2019 as regulations. And those regulations were very prescriptive. And the purpose was so that different schools can't say that the local school district is, is treating them differently than the others. So they were extremely objective check marks, exact number of hours expected to be taught, the exact subjects. Well, the private schools um, united against them, okay? And that includes not only the Hasidic yeshivas in question, even fancy independent schools, the Catholic schools, they opposed it. They each had their own reason. Essentially, they're already complying with the law. Why are they suffering because of these dozens of Hasidic yeshivas? So those regulations were derailed and then more recently in March, the state re-released new regulations. They're a little bit broader and vaguer. Um, so in some sense, you know, it's been downgraded a bit and weakened, but on the other hand, it's also more passable. And um, so that's basically how this all came about and I'll end here. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And that was such a great overview um, because this is a topic I'm quite new to. So I'm glad you also corrected that because um, I'm learning about it myself as we go along. So thank you so much. And also thank you for creating that organization. Um, next, we're going to have uh, Ruth Messenger uh, speak for a few minutes um, generally and also specific, specifically about why she, she is interested in this issue and what she would like to see happen with it in the immediate future. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Garrett. So um, let me just start by saying that Natuli would not say this about himself, but he is a real um, organizer and political leader with a great deal of moral courage. He's told do his story. This is somebody who figured out what was going wrong because of his own experience and then founded an organization and has now for many years been trying to challenge the city and state bureaucracies to do what the law requires. Uh, so let's be clear. Yes, the regulations and the guidelines were proposed and then withdrawn and now they're new ones. But the basic requirement is that children who are being raised in the city and state of New York, as elsewhere, um, must have an education. That's why we have a public education system. And then we recognized years ago, ages ago, that there would be private schools. Many of them actually initially, I think, were religious or parochial schools of one kind or another. And it was the position of government because we believe to the greatest extent possible, but not to an absolute point in the separation of church and state. We said, okay, people can have their own schools, secular schools, religious schools, then not send their children to public school, but there have to be standards, then the standards require a basic education. So I come at this issue, um, Professor, because I spent 20 years, 20 wonderful years working in and for city government. I believe in government. I'm a fierce um, descendant of great stories of the public education system in the of New York ways in which it educated my ancestors when they came here. Um, I'm a parent of uh, a long time ago, parent of three uh, public New York City public school graduates. I mean, they've been out for a long time. But I believe in this purpose of the schools. And I love the, the fact that the system, the government system, allows people to have their own schools if they meet basic standards. And when I met Naftuli and began to understand the issue, I was literally horrified because these schools don't meet basic standards. As Naftuli tried to suggest to you, but I will be very clear and specific, they don't want to meet those standards. They want to educate the young men in their community to be deeply immersed in Jewish text from a variety of perspectives, which I um, have great regard and respect for, but they want that to be done exclusively, basically so that those young men educated in that system will have no options in their lives other than to come and teach in that system. Um, I had experience when I was in government, by the way, not to be referenced this briefly, but to meet many of the women in these communities um, who were indeed, as Naftuli says, the breadwinners as well as the caregivers and the home managers because they were the only people in a, the only half of any given couple who had enough basic English and math to get a job in the more secular community that would raise money for their families. So I saw that burden on those women. But I think more to the point, this is an independent education system rooted in the space that our government gives for people to support different their own faiths, but only if certain standards are met. Those standards are not being met for what will increasingly be larger and larger numbers, particularly as you heard of young men in part of the ultra-Orthodox community in Brooklyn. And those people will be denied an education. Very few of them will have the resources, the personal resources that Naftuli exercised to go get that education later. They, in a sense, don't know what they're missing. I like that part of his story. They don't realize immediately, nor do their parents necessarily realize immediately what they are not learning and what they won't be able to do. And this is a violation of the government's right to ensure an education for everybody. It's a direct slap for all of us because it's it, it allows people to graduate from high school or to finish their um, their education without being competent to work um, any place in the community, which means that in some long-term way, they're gonna to have to be supported. 
Um, and in my mind, it disrespects, I know that people would disagree with me, but it disrespects the Jewish commitment to education as a, as a high level value. So um, I'm a strong supporter of the work that Yafet is doing. And you ask, this is a moment and it's, the question is what can people do? So I was a small degree helpful in exerting a little bit of pressure on the independent and private schools to not oppose this round of guidelines and, and requirements, which they are, not, they are not opposing them. But we need the public to be heard saying, but this is a basic requirement of what it means to be part of a civil society is to have guidelines that ensure that anybody going to school, including a school of his or her family's choice, that is a religiously oriented school to nevertheless meet basic guidelines um, and ensure a level of secular education that will allow graduates to function um, uh, fully in their communities and in the city. And the fact that this has been going on, this battle has been going on for so long, uh, as Naftuli again suggested, is because city and state officials have been lured to not be tough on this issue because they believe it will get them a certain degree of political support. And that is basically trading their own political advantage um, for um, and enhancing their own political advantage and allowing um, thousands of young people to lose out on an education and that it fundamentally violates all principles of equity and justice. So I'm proud to be connected with this effort and hope that, that everyone listening and watching will actually click on the change and just indicate on the, click in the chat and just indicate that you support the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just to follow up on that, I have two daughters in the New York public schools, and I emphatically agree with this idea of the importance of public education, particularly for Jews and Jewish immigrants to New York. And also as a professor and director at Hunter, um, where I've been for four years, I've had many encounters with students who really, really struggle who come out of this community simply um, to write an essay or to have the basic math. So it may sound like an abstract concept, but I see it regularly, um, the pain and the um, profound desire for learning and sense of not, not having been given that of, of students um, regularly. So it, it's very close to my heart too. So thank you. Um, now I'm going to have Professor Smichael Jr. speak um, from the Director of Public Policy at Hunter. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, really a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to say a special hello to Ruth Messenger, who I met early in my career in her 1997 mayoral race, um, um, volunteering for, for, for that campaign. So it's wonderful to see you again. Um, you know, I'm, one of the things that I, I took from everyone's statement today is, um, you know, that, 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 the, the intersection of education and public policy is, is incredible, it's, it's nuanced. And I think in many ways, I sort of, I think about this and one of the reasons I wanted to get my doctorate in, in education uh, and politics is because of what I think has been addressed today, which is the, and what we all see is the emancipatory, emancipatory impact of education and how important that is um, in, in, in trying to address individual aspirations uh, for young people, particularly as they get older, and for the parents, quite frankly. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm, my mother's a public school teacher for over 30, for about 30 years, um, but she sent me to Catholic school for 12 years. <laughs> and so, um, you know, these are, these are, these are difficult questions that parents have to uh, make for their, for their children every day. And one of the things I want to do, particularly as I do in a lot of research around the Northern civil rights movement is to sort of connect this to um, um, other, uh, other movements, pushes for equity in education. One of the things that's always striking to my students and I think about this often is there's no national federal right to an education. It doesn't exist. You cannot find it in the US constitution. It is a state by state um, right. There's positive language in state constitutions, some short, some long. Um, about what the state will provide in terms of or should provide in terms of education. I think New York's language is sound basic education um, to all students. 
And that's an, that's an important point because you can see that all of the political activity, there's a lot on the federal level, particularly um, when we saw with Brown versus Board of Ed and subsequent, um, subsequent court battles, but there's a tremendous amount of activity on the state level. And to, uh, to Ruth's point earlier, the, the, the political wrangling is substantial. Uh, when we when we think about um, the, the the forces at play, the political uh, machinations, the voting box, all of that that push and influence elected officials, this is important to parents because and communities because social um, schools, education, um, and schools themselves are not just places where kids learn and parents drop off their kids uh, every day. They are centers of social, cultural, political, and moral reproduction. So we take very seriously what happens in that school building because it says something about who we are as a, as a, as a people. Um, the, the, what we teach our kids and how we teach our kids says something about us. It's, a, it's not just a political statement, it's also a formal declaration of our values. And so this is, it's, it's incredibly critical that we, that we try to get this right. Um, but if you, but interesting and to, to everybody's point here, um, there is this question about um, whose right is it? Who is best to teach our kids? Is it the parents or is it the state? And But when you focus on the state and you think about the language that they use to, 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 to say that we have to educate all our kids and it should be done in a certain way, um, it's important to think about how much the state actually spends, particularly in, in this, on, on these schools. Um, the state spends roughly, or the DOE roughly spends about $100 million a year of public funds that go to yeshivas, $100 million a year. That is about, that is outsized relative to the population of students in the city and in, in the state. Um, so it's an extraordinary amount of money. Um, and the question, the question is, can, how much right, particularly with that amount of money being spent, how much right does the state have um, to insist that their dollars are being spent in a very specific way. Um, you know, there were private schools that had concerns about some of these regulations and so on. So there was this sort of weird, um, but, but a perhaps understandable coalition that was being built as sort of a pushback to these regulations. But, you know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of support for the regulations themselves, particularly because it's because of the money that's being, um, that's involved here. The state, being the sort of focal point for education policy is, you know, within their right to say that we have to um, insist on these regulations. Otherwise, we're we're going against our own constitutional policy here. Um, and but again, we do see this tension being played in so many other areas. If you think about what's happening with specialized high schools and concerns around how you know what what factors are going to go into who gets into specialized high schools there are questions here about what you know should we stay with the test should we add other measures and you see the political wrangling around that and that political wrangling has led to non action quite frankly over time and that's the thing that's what i think we don't want to see here because the longer that there is non action there are young people um, uh, experiencing what NAFTA was experience in terms of having these aspirations uh, and not being able to fulfill them, which is why I go back to the point about the emancipatory aspects of education and what what they what that can do for communities. And you know, as I look at even the you know the history of the Northern Civil Rights Movement, which again I'm spending a lot of time studying these days and researching, um, this is tied to broader political impacts, right? So it's not just organizing around the urgency about what's happening in schools, but that organizing actually has the ability to, uh, to branch out into other areas of political involvement. And it's, that was important for African-Americans, that was important for Latino communities pushing for more inclusive curriculum, bilingual curriculum. And my sense is that it is important here as well. So I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take questions down the road. Thank you. And just such diverse and interesting answers to the question from so many angles. So I'm going to start with more of a hardball question, and then I'm going to go into sort of 
gentler ones, um, but I think it's sort of good to get this out there in front of us um, as we move forward in our discussion. And just a reminder again to the audience, please put your questions into the Q&A as we'd like to hear from you. So, so some of the pushback against this has been that the regulations don't take into account the value of Jewish education in the yeshiva or in these ultra Orthodox yeshivas in particular. Um, and I would like to hear from the participants about that particular sort of form of pushback against these regulations. Whoever wants to go first. I mean, I think I think you heard it in hours. And of course, we take and I, and I said there's a there's an interesting history in the United States about allowing people, you know, it, it would be entirely possible. And I I'm not an expert on this, but I assume there are some countries where and education is compulsory, and the only education made available is the one provided by the government. Of course, that has its own flaws and faults, but I'm sure there are systems like that. In the U.S., we said early on, or you can run a different school, but you meet, must meet some basic standards. Now, look, a lot of us took, um, you know, some, I went to school with people who took catechism classes after school. I went to um, a dreadful Hebrew school for a few hours um, a week, uh, uh, two afternoons a week. But the point was, yes, there were other studies and there were other activities. You know, you can be a, I mean, take sports, right? You can be raising the next um, U.S. Opian champion and she can be eight and you can see her tennis potential. She does still have to go to school. I went to school, I think probably some people had this experience with kids who got up at five in the morning to go to the only ice skating rink that was open and to skate for two hours because they and their parents had a vision of their becoming professional skaters and one of them did. But you fit that into your day. And what you heard from Naftuli, which is, I wanna say admirable, except that it goes too far, is that in the yeshivot, there was some requirement, whatever the numbers are, six or seven hours of learning for younger kids. And then when you got to the high school, there were 12 hours a day of learning. So I respect their notion that they have a lot to teach and they wanna teach it in depth and they wanna produce knowledgeable Jewish, knowledgeable and informed Jewish teachers and rabbis, but they can't use every hour of the day for that to the exclusion of teaching secular subjects because they're part of a broader community. And let me point out that that broader community um, provides them all kinds of services. You know, none of us, none of us, I'm gonna to say to everyone on this panel and in this audience, none of us spends enough of each day saying, okay, um, I gripe about taxes, but it's why I have a fire department. It's why I have an ambulance system. It's why I have a public hospital system. It's why I have street lights. It's why I have street paving. I know all the gripes, but the point is, we support a government that meets a whole lot of our basic needs. And our government has been flexible in how it um, expects individuals and families to meet educational needs. And it allows a lot of space and time for them. Um, Leah, uh, Lea, I don't think that's a hard question. It just says you can't do it all of the time. It doesn't say, so just to be clear, it doesn't say you must attend a public school licensed by the government from nine to three every day and anything else you want to learn from a sports perspective, from a faith perspective, from a technology perspective, you can only do an hours after school. It says any group that wants to set up a school to specialize in anything, including the, the deep and important uh, Jewish text learning can do that as long as it meets basic educational standards for some hours of every day. And, and many, uh, Naftuli could give you the numbers, but many yeshiva do that. Let's be clear. It's a, it's a handful or a couple of handfuls that do not. Thank if you. May, Go ahead. If I may follow Ruth on this, thank you so much, Ruth. That was very wonderful. Um, but you know what some of these yeshiva leaders are arguing, and I've seen some of their legal papers on this, where they, it is a real stretch. Like, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, there are, like Ruth mentioned, there are some really good Jewish day schools where they provide a robust Jewish and secular education. And even during the secular portion, if you're doing math and, and you just happen to mention, you know, the, the, the height and length of a sukkah, which is like the, the, for the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, to incorporate some Judaism or, or, or Jewish concepts, Jewish holidays, um, stuff like that within existing secular courses is very much possible. Why not? What these yeshiva leaders are trying to do is to say, we're going to teach Judaic studies all day long, Torah, Talmud, and then retroactively, we're going to try to interpret in these texts 
oh, here you could get a little bit of math. Here you get a little bit of, um, I guess you could say history. Keep in mind, the Torah, the Talmud, they don't have US history because the US didn't exist back then, let, or let alone New York history. And those are actual legal requirements, right? Um, they don't have modern science, um, you know? So, but then they're still trying to sort of, you know, read into it. So for instance, they talk about how when they teach about Noah's Ark in the Torah and the Old Testament, they talk about different animals. So that's sort of like touching on science. Obviously that's not a course on science, right? And that's the point they're trying to sort of mislead the public and, and education officials about the extent of how these um, required subjects are or aren't incorporated in the Judaic studies. One other thing I wanted to um, comment on something that Professor Smichael mentioned is um, it's true that the, the number 100 million um, has been thrown around. I just want to point out that in this budget that was just passed uh, a few months ago, two months ago, last month by New York State, um, that alone included $195 million for mandated service aid, um, tens of millions of dollars in EANs, which is federal money coming through the state, $45 million for uh, non-public school safety and equipment grant, $58 million for STEM reimbursement. And this is just state funding. Some of it gets passed through the city. Some of it comes from the federal government. It doesn't include Title I or Title III, some nutrition funding. It doesn't include vouchers um, that uh, the public doesn't know that there are actual vouchers that the city and the state give to um, mostly yeshivas based on the criteria. It ends up benefiting mostly Orthodox yeshivas. So we're actually talking about many hundreds of millions of dollars, not just $100 million. And this is all coming from taxpayer dollars. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not here to argue against funding private or religious schools. But the point is this matters to New York state taxpayers. In fact, that's why we're having a panel, you know, speaking to the public because this matters to you. It's literally your taxes that are funding schools that refuse to teach English and math and science. Thank you. Um, any other comments? And, and I'll ask another question. Uh, so get, talking specifically about these new regulations, I was wondering if our uh, speakers could speak about one aspect of the regulations that they find quite exciting. And also if there's anything that they could improve in terms of the regulations, knowing, however, we're in a real political wor world and we have to sort of, you know, there's a give and take. Um, and I'd love to hear from the speakers on this. Well, I can't say that I've ever found regulations hugely exciting, but um, so maybe I'm positive. Rejecting. Sorry, not exciting. Positive in terms of improving our, the, improving the well, world I of think, the students. I think, yeah, I think the answer there is the essence of what they are. They made a serious effort um, to put out guidelines, uh, and I think that the state education department, when it did that initially, was already getting some some uh, Naftuli referred to it as some pressure to go slowly because they were trying to keep the community that's most affected by this on their side, on their team. Um, you know, there are books about this, um, but they did put out guidelines. And I thought that the private school, organization of private schools that objected to those guidelines were coming from a, a bad place because their position was like, we know what we do we teach the right stuff. And so we don't want any um, State Department of Investigator having to come walk through our school. That seemed to me to be really sort of sad and silly. And I said that to them, like you're running great schools. Um, the, you're not, you're certainly meeting the, the minimum standards, but, but why does it hurt to have somebody from the State Ed Department see the great work that you're doing? Anyway, they've gone back, they've come back with a new set of regulations and I'm pleased that they've stay, stayed on the case and just hoping that whatever the range of public commentary, um, not only are these new guidelines adopted, but that they're enforced because we know where the bad, from this point of view, the non-compliance is, and we want those schools to be sanctioned unless they meet the basic minimum standards. Anyone else? I can okay. go in the oh, meantime. Yeah, 
And um, then, I will say these regulations, <clears throat> they're, they're sort of broken down into three parts. One is what are the actual standards? What is expected of non-public schools to teach? The other one is the enforcement mechanism and that has what's called multiple pathways. And then the third one is some sort of, I'm gonna call it accountability and transparency. And to be honest, uh, I'm not as optimistic as Ruth about these um, regulations, which is why Yafet hasn't officially endorsed these regulations. Rather, we think it's a step in the right direction and there's, there are areas where they can improve it before adopting it. So what we're most excited about, I guess I would say, is the last um, part, which is, it's a new level of transparency and accountability that doesn't exist. <clears throat> the viewers would be surprised to learn that you can open a school tomorrow in your basement and you can operate it for 10 years and no one will know. The state doesn't even have to know. People always talk about a registered school, a licensed school. Those terms don't actually apply here. Um, schools can operate in New York State without registering, without anything, especially if they don't get government funding. Um, then, then nobody has to know except the fire department to know that it's not a fire trap. Other than that, nobody comes in to see. With, this, with these new regulations, that is going to change um, if they're adopted. And, and the local school district will have to know each school that exists, and then they'll have to know which pathway of the multiple pathways outlined each school is choosing to sort of uh, determine that they're substantially equivalent. Now, as an organization that's, you know, the next step is going to be to oversee it to ensure that the schools are in fact complying, that gives us a good starting point to see, okay, this school, this, this is where they're located, this is what they're claiming, the pathway they're taking to, to meet substantial equivalency, are they in fact doing so? If we get a complaint from a parent that says, my school may be claiming that they're providing a substantially equivalent education, here's a document that proves clearly that they don't, and my son confirms they don't provide science education, that allows us to then take the next step to um, you know, pursue that school and, and to help that parent file a complaint. So that's the part that we're excited about. The least excited part, I'm not sure if that was your question, but I will say it anyway. <laughs> the, the new proposed regulations have a one pathway is for schools to simply um, say that they're taking assessments, okay? They're using assessments to demonstrate that they're substantially equivalent. Not only is that currently vague in the regulations, but even if it were clarified, coming from one of these yeshivas where occasionally we would get government tests, uh, we would be given the answers. It was administered and proctored and graded by our own yeshiva leaders who obviously had an, a, a certain, you know, wanted us to perform at a certain way. And that, that pathway, frankly, is not sufficient. If, if it's up to us, we would say, remove it completely. You can leave the registration, accreditation, and LSA review with some additional guardrails. Oh, uh, teaching to the test is a big problem. <laughs> it's a problem everywhere, so you're right. I would also just add just very quickly, I, you know, in, in all of this, I, I always want to center the child. And if there are concerns about, what are the, one of the concerns that I always have is on this issue of accountability, right? And both accountability and transparency. That I see that built into the into these regulations. I know that there there is substantial concern around that. But then, what happens if this if these schools are found to not be in compliance, and they close, um, or there's some some uh, I don't know uh, oversight, some version of takeover, if you will. Um, I think also about what happens to the child in that process and where do they go in, in, in that in that moment, because then I think your your um, condemning them is probably too strong a word, but then you're you're sort of pushing them further and further into a bit of an abyss where nothing, where still nothing is getting done. And so what I what I hope happens um, to these to these with these regulations with respect to accountability. Um, is that uh, appropriate measures are being taken to make sure that one way or another that child is getting that education um, and, and that it's not just sort of held in limbo over a longer period of time. So this is Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask a final question to all three panelists before we take a few questions from the audience. Look, everyone is so burnt out. You know, we're pulled in a million directions. It's 
you know, there's a lot of terrible things going on in our country and the world. And so to actually make the transition from sitting on our sofa to going to a web link to writing a letter is it's it's hard it's harder than it's ever been to do to kind of motivate ourselves to actually do action so what i'd like each speaker to speak about briefly is if you look down a year from now five years from now and and speak on either if these regulations are not put in place and the status quo stays as it is what will the impact be on our city and our kids or if you'd prefer to be more positive, if we put these regulations into place a year from now, five years, what will the actual impact be of them? So who would like to go? Naftali, do you wanna go first? I could certainly try. Um, uh, if, if, if I may, I'll try to answer both. Uh, at the current pace, you know, keep in mind the ultra-Orthodox community, specifically the Hasidic subset, of the community is the fastest growing population in New York, maybe the United States. Again, if anybody didn't hear me, I'm the middle child of 17 kids. I have over, I think, 70 nephews and nieces by now and counting, right? So, so this is, you know, we did a study in 2017 that projects that by 2030, 30% 30 of Brooklyn's youth will be Hasidic. 30% of all of Brooklyn's youth will be Hasidic. I'm not trying to say this as a scary thing because obviously it's a blessing that our communities are growing. What is scary is when such a substantial number, a portion of the population is not learning even the intro to any kind of history outside of the Jews, you know, leaving Egypt for Israel, right? The, the needs to be, this is important for all of us. And that's what, what I think is sort of a concern if nothing is being done. Of course, it's also a, a drain on the, on the um, economy and the, the, the public, benefits when you have fully able-bodied and capable, smart, brilliant people who could, with a little bit of education, could have been something, could have pursued a degree or could have just, you know, gotten a, a basic, you know, a, a decent entry-level job and been a, a taxpayer. So that is the concern if this is not passed. If it, if it does pass, and I should point out the, there are regulations, then there are guidelines, and then comes the actual enforcement, right? So it's not just passing these regulations, but actually enforcing them properly. I think it would benefit not only the Hasidic community, which I think it will, right? Improve their, their um, livelihoods and their standard of living. And it would help those who choose to leave the community. I'm not gonna pretend that's not important um, because there are people who do choose to leave the community. They shouldn't be struggling uh, because of the lack of education. And then it'll have a ripple effect for all of New York uh, to, to, to know that all children have a basic education and participate in the same kind of civic discussions that are happening and are not sort of operating in sort of their own bubble. I would, yeah, I would also, I would just add to that just quickly that, um, you know, when I mentioned earlier that schools are centers of sort of social, moral, political reproduction, cultural reproduction, um, they are also the mechanism through which we learn civic engagement, or at least it's supposed to. Um, and, you know, the, all the data to show that, you know, those that are more educated generally are more civically engaged and vote more often. And so, yeah, we can see the importance of wanting to make sure that this growing population, uh, which is, say, is 30%, it will be 30%, um, is civically engaged. There's, we see value in that, but the, the one caution that I have is on the layering of what we want over what is what 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 the community that we're that we're talking about wants. In other words, how do you create a movement that is grassroots and also has buy-in from within? That is critically important to its sustainability in the long run. Um, and the, so it's not that it's, in a, it's, in a, it's impossible to do, uh, but the concern is that, you know, and, and I think one of the things that, you know, I've experienced in a lot of ways that I've done work like this um, is the concern that um, you, you're, you're supplant, that there is a supplanting of one set of values for another. Um, and the, the key to, to me to making this work is being able to say, no, your values are my values, but we, we also have to find a way to sort of move forward in this environment. 
Um, and as you talk about Leah, th this environment and everything that's going on in the world, um, I think a lot of our conversation needs to be along those lines. Like, look, we can no longer ignore what's happening. Like I was saying on a podcast uh, yesterday, that given what happened in Buffalo as a black man, I don't even feel space safe in spaces I used to feel space in anymore. There's no sort of avoiding um, uh, these issues. You have to confront it sort of head on. Um, and because, you know, because the world is literally at our doorstep and for some of us, it's on our device that we have in our pocket. And, um, and I, you know, often say, that not my generation, maybe a generation or two after mine, I'm Gen X, so I don't know what's after that, millennial Gen Z. Certainly Gen Z is the first generation that can, that can learn about how the world works without going to a parent to ask. Um, and if you have this sort of expansion of that kind of information, if all of that, uh, if the speed with which we can communicate, particularly through social media, is in, empowering us to be more mobilized, to be mobilized in ways that we weren't, ever before um, this, with respect to the speed and small d democratizing movements, um, then it really is important um, to, to, to engage the grassroots of this effort um, because it really is, it really is at, at our doorstep. Everything that we like and don't like about the world is literally at our doorstep um, as we speak. So the importance of this is critical to communicate. Thank you. Um, Ruth, I know we only have you for a few more minutes, but we're, we're all sticking around for a, a bit. Um, did you want to add anything? No, no, thank you very much. I feel like I've made the case. I think the case has been made. I thank uh, Basil for those um, last few words. Um, I assume if there are questions, the three, four, three of you will be adequate to answer them. And I need to go and discuss the United States foreign policy in Afghanistan. So I appreciate being let off the hook for the last few minutes. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, turn to, so we have some great audience questions, pretty detailed ones. I'm going to start with one um, that I'll, I'll read because I, I, I'm very curious to your answer to this. Um, the question is, the way they're written, I think a lot of day schools would probably comply using state assessments like regents exams and the standardized assessments in elementary schools. So I think that makes sense for them. I can tell you, however, that there are day school parents in the five towns wondering whether the local school board who will now oversee them and that the school board where this particular person lives is really not interested in being saddled with that responsibility. So I think the broader question is how you sort of see these regulations and the relationship between local school boards enforcing them and, and the schools themselves. And, and I guess the parent role as well for whoever would like to answer. I'll just say very quickly, but that is the key about the accountability, right? Like who actually, who's gonna go do that? And um, that's where, and I think that that was earlier point, I think you made and maybe Ruth made it as well, that you, that there, are, there might end up being a thousand ways to sort of skirt these, these rules and these regulations. And it's true, you know, in so many other areas, the state had been, ha has been and can be lacking in the city. And cities in terms of um, in terms of enforcement, so that's why that accountability piece is incredible is so so critical because without it, without teeth, it just you know we're back to square one. I will say um, I don't know. I think there may be a misunderstanding with um, uh, the person asking this question. Um, the truth is, for most Jewish day schools, Catholic schools, and private independent schools their pathways will probably not be assessments. I might be wrong. Uh, there are several other pathways, um, namely accreditation, which most independent schools are being accredited. Um, and the same is true with some of the Catholic schools and, and with some of the Jewish schools as well. So, you know, I think assessments, it, I'm afraid is, is mostly a loophole, really, just like sort of a gift to the Hasidic yeshiva leaders be like, give your assessments, give the answers, whatever, and then tell us you, you did well, and then we won't look at you. That's why we're so concerned about it. I mean, I'm sure there are some schools that, that would you know, legitimately like to use the assessments pathway if they, they happen not to use accreditation at the moment or, or being registered, um, which means that they've been reviewed by the state themselves. But for the most part, this is not what most independent schools that comply with the law are gonna be choosing. 
So the audience, a, a few members were asking then, so why write letters in support of these regulations? Because how will they be enforced in a different way now than they were before? If you could talk about that, please. Oh, sure. Until now, they simply weren't enforced, to be honest. If you're following the saga in New York City, where the city was notified back in 2015, and they still haven't done anything to actually remedy it. After four and a half years, they produced a report. And since then, they've done nothing. You know, even though the report found that 26 out of 28 yeshivas they investigated did not meet substantial equivalency. This regulation does put in place an enforcement mechanism. Um, but again, you know, everything comes down to the enforcement. It includes a, a, a punitive measure. If a local school di district is refusing to fulfill their responsibility, the state would pull back some of their funding, okay? It could pull back as many as half of the district's funding um, to compel them to fulfill their responsibility. So, you know, in theory, this has some serious enforcement mechanisms. Again, at the moment, one of the pathways are at least are problematic. The other ones need to be, you know, tightened. So, like I said in the beginning, we're not necessarily pushing to support these regulations. If you look at our website, which um, someone put in the, in the chat before, we outlined what some of our concerns are, and even the templates uh, that we provided include um, some of those concerns in the letters to the state. But my understanding though, um, Naftali, is that you still are hoping that the audience would support at least this step as part of a broader program, is that correct? Yeah, it's important to understand though, the, the public comment period for regulation is not meant to be an upvote or a downvote. Okay. I know our opponents are using this to be like, no, we oppose it, we oppose it. And, and unfortunately, and in theory, you're not supposed to look at how many people opposed it, how many people supported it. It's not hard to mobilize the entire ultra-Orthodox community against these regulations, which is what the yeshiva leaders are doing by scaremongering and saying that they're being assimilated and that the schools are gonna be shut down and parents are gonna be sent to prison and so forth. They're whipping up the crowd against it but the truth is that's not how it's supposed to be done. I support it, I oppose it. Okay. And that's what public comment is. You're meant to respond critically about these regulations and that's what we're doing. We're saying, of course, it's a step in the right direction. Here's how you should tweak it how you tweak to it. make it better. And that's, I didn't actually that. realize that until you said that. <laughs> that's super helpful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a comment um, by uh, Bob Marks um, for your information by contrast. My yeshiva, Rabbi Jacob Joseph, graduated 74 of us in 1963. We all wound up with college degrees, rabbis, scientists, business leaders, teachers, soldiers, etc. So my question out of that one is why has this changed so much? And, and you know, how has this, when did this happen? How did it happen? If, if you know that, if not, I have a follow-up question from somebody else, but I just thought I would put it out there. Well, to be clear, I don't know how much has changed. I mean, certainly a lot has changed and it has deteriorated over the years um, as the Hasidic community uh, grew and sort of, uh, um, you know, exerted their muscle more. And there was sort of a sense like, we could take care of our own. We don't, we're not gonna let anyone, you know, look into our business. He happens to be referencing a school that um, even now provides a, a good education. Um, I think you mentioned RJJ. It's a school that prides itself on precisely being able to provide a full um, secular education alongside a Judaic education. And that's what we would love to model. What's interesting is <clears throat> the, the, one of the heads of that school who unfortunately passed away last year, his son is the lawyer for the yeshiva leaders opposing the regulations for the Hasidic yeshivas. What I'm pointing out is that unfortunately it's become this thing where even the some of the schools that do comply with the law, some of the yeshivas that are literally a model for what we would like to see are, are providing cover for the Hasidic yeshivas that do not provide a basic education. Thank you. Okay, so it's two o'clock. I'm about to wrap up. I hope you guys, can you stay for just one more quick question because we got a great last question. For those of you who have to leave, um, I just want to remind you, this is a point to have your voices heard and what Naftali said is so important that this is the discussion moment that we're having, which um, it's very important to clarify that and to make your voices heard about how you feel about this. And we have provided a link and I want to throw out one final question and then we will end. 
Um, because I think it's very, it's a very important question. What has been the harm to the community that has chosen to go this route and not complied with basic secular education? I believe the common view is that these communities seem to be doing well as viewed from their communities who don't get the same sort of services, whether provided by local government or the community itself. So Naftali or uh, Basil, if you want to answer that. The question is, what is the harm being done to those students in the current? You're on, you're on mute, Leah, I'm sorry. Sorry, everything seems to look okay. I mean, they seem to be doing all right. So why does this matter to us? Well, I, I mean, I, I can't speak from, clearly I can't speak from a religious standpoint. Um, I can only say that from, and, and owing to a point that I made earlier, um, you know, from the state's point of view, if the state takes responsibility for what it's teaching its, its children, um, and, and by extension, the city does as well, then the, what regulations exist for all, they have the right to, to enforce. And, you know, Naftali made the point earlier about, you know, what can be done with curriculum and so on. And when I went to a Catholic school and, um, you know, got, I thought, a fantastic education. I also learned what it, what it meant from an academics, at least in the schoolroom, about what it meant to be a good Catholic, although I'm an advocate, which is another story altogether. Um, but, um, you know, I, I had to learn what it meant to be Catholic and, and the, the and, and Catholicism. And um, so there's a, but so there's a way to be able to teach both, at least that's what I think I hear, um, so that you could be productive in whatever you choose to do, um, secular or non-secular path in your, in your life. Um, so the question is what does, so, so from the state's point of view, I, my sense is that they feel, again, if, we've, if there's history to suggest that both can be done, and we do have this right based and, and responsibility based on the constitutional language to provide a sound basic education. And by the way, that has been defined and redefined in multiple court cases over decades by communities of color in particular who've tried to get a clearer definition of that for the purpose of equity and accountability. So if that is being defined more and more over time and the state feels that it's their responsibility to exact, to, to push these regulations, then I, I don't know that the premise of the question is, is correct in that they're not, they may not, these, the state is saying that these kids are not okay because they're not able to go out into the world and be, and, and, and be as, as productive and educated based on this, what the state believes that that is. And from that point of view, um, they have absolutely every right and responsibility to step in, my view. Thank you. And I, just to piggyback on what you just said, when you said the kids are not okay, because I see those kids who are not okay and who are desperate to get a college education and feel they don't have any of the most basic tools. So I want to thank both of you so much for being here. Um, I'm sure that if people need to contact, particularly Yafit, that they can email and contact the organization if they have any follow-up questions. And just to reiterate again, we have until the end of the month to make our voices heard on this very important uh, point. Uh, again, it's uh, May 31st. And so please do uh, let your, you know, let the School of Education know, let the Board of Education know, we have provided a link, your feelings on this and, and, and how you see it. So thank you everyone and be safe and be well and have a wonderful summer. Thank you. Thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you, thank you for hosting. Thank you.